a lot of feedback. Again, we're gonna get started right at 6.30. Thanks for being here, everybody. All right, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Both my clocks say 6.30, so we're gonna go and get started. Again, over the course of the next hour, um, I'll be sharing with you our reopening plan. Uh, during this presentation, we won't be able to have the opportunity or time to discuss individual student schedules or personnel issues. My amazing assistant principal team, Ms. Sanchez, Mr. Eveleth, Mr. Giami, uh, will be monitoring our chat rooms. So if you have a general question that's related to our reopening plan, please feel free to type in your question on either the YouTube live chat feature or the Zoom chat feature. And one of our amazing assistant principals will work to answer your question in live time. At the end of our presentation tonight, I'll answer questions sent in from uh, the Google form that we don't actually answer during the course of the presentation. And we'll answer as many questions as possible, time permitting until 7.30 at the end uh, that we don't get the opportunity to maybe answer that you send in through the chat. Now, if you don't get the opportunity to have your question answered tonight, please don't fret. We are going to uh, have three more meetings such as this. Our first one is gonna be next Wednesday. I know originally I scheduled it for next Tuesday, but uh, I realized after the fact that that's election night. So uh, we're gonna move next week's meeting to Wednesday. And then we have the following two Tuesdays as well. I'll be sending out info later this week on those additional town hall meetings. Also note that we'll be posting a frequently asked questions from tonight's town hall and the other halls that we'll have later uh, throughout the trimester on an FAQ sheet on our webpage. And you can also uh, email one of, uh, one of us in administration, again, myself, Ryan Schultz, Mr. Eveleth, our assistant principal, Ms. Sanchez or Mr. Giami. So again, thanks for being here, Nighthawks. We're glad you're here. Again, tonight we're gonna to really focus and hone in on what our reopening plan is. We're gonna look at what the day in the life of both a student that uh, will be virtual learning and an in-person uh, student will look like. And again, we're going to answer questions from the Google form that was sent out last week. And again, if you have any questions that are generally related to our uh, reopening plan, please feel free to write those in the chat. And again, we'll work to answer those in live time. And we'll close at 7.30. Again, thank you guys for being here. We are excited to have you join us. So again, we're talking tonight about our uh, reopening of our secondary school, specifically tonight, Del Norte. And again, some of the beliefs that we have are obviously that in-person teaching and learning is our most effective model for school. Uh, we're very excited that we are spending tonight together and getting the opportunity to share our plan with you. We also wanna make sure that we're bringing back students and staff in a very safe way while they are coming back to campus. So tonight we're gonna to talk a little bit about some of the options that we've gone through, really going back to uh, the beginning of summer uh, where we initially looked at potentially reorganizing. Uh, this has been extremely challenging at the high school level. We'll go into a few of those uh, whys. We'll talk about the virtual for all, which is our current status and where we're headed to next, which is our simultaneous concurrent model. And tonight you're gonna to hear a lot about the what, the what are we doing? Uh, we really wanna start with addressing the why we're doing the what. And you see a great example here in the picture of this screen and the why behind everything we, doing, uh, everything we do is our students and uh, your children. And we're looking to really give our students an opportunity to get back on campus and uh, know that that's extremely important for their mental well-being, our mental well-being, your mental well-being, and for the future of everything that we're going to do in our country. 
So again, as we look at any model, we want to make sure that there is a viable instructional model. We want to make sure that we have the humans, human resource requirements and the financial resource requirements to execute that model to be in the best interest of our students. So we've really taken some time to make sure that the models that we are implementing currently and in the future meet these three needs in our current system. So again, back early in the summer when we began this process of opening for the school year, we initially looked at reorganizing. And this was the attempt to have those students and staff that chose to be virtual learning to be in their own lane, as I've called it, and to have those that choose to be on campus on a completely separate schedule. There were many benefits to this model, too, being that it was the best model for personal choice due to health concerns and uh, that everybody would get their preferred model from the July survey that was conducted. Now, as we begin to delve into looking at reorganization at the high school level, we realized that there were many more challenges to executing the reorganization model at the high school level. And some of these are listed here. We would have many students, over 700 from Del Norte alone, that had we reorganized would not have access to advanced placement classes, CTE classes, classes that would meet A through G requirements, and even graduation requirements. We really began to understand that there would be limited access to specific courses, many of our singleton courses, and many courses uh, that require specific credentials. We also realized the stress that this would have on uh, staff. For the reorganization model to exist, teachers would have to be assigned new content that they aren't necessarily used to teaching or maybe have never taught before. There was also a funding restriction to reorganization at the high school level. Just the sheer cost of trying to hire additional staff and to find additional staff uh, is, was very challenging and also the just sheer number of schedule changing that would have to take place. Many of our students and families course requests from the spring would not be able to be honored. So we then moved to the current model that we are in, which is our virtual learning model. Now this model does again have benefits to us. It allows all students to have the proper classes that they signed up for and are needed for you see CSU requirements, A through G requirements, and graduation requirements. This model also allows for no disruption to student and staff schedules. We, uh, within our current model, we have our students who are able to be connected with teachers that teach the content that they do so well. It was again, the easiest way to follow the California Department of Health guidelines. And again, all class offerings are made available to students. Within any model, we know there are challenges as well. And some of the challenges that we have found in our current model relate to authentic instruction can be limited in this model. Some of our hands-on courses, our lab courses, our access to courses that need tools and special equipment and machines is obviously very limited in this model. We also know that teacher and student interface is reduced. We know that this model has begun to develop mental health issues for our staff, our students, and our families. And we also realize that this model is, poses challenges because of the amount of time that we are all on screen. So with that being said, we are transitioning to bringing students back onto campus in what we are calling the simultaneous and concurrent model. Now this model, it allows us to meet both the needs of our in-person students that have selected this and also those that are not able to return. The same with staff, we're able to meet the needs of our staff who will be teaching in person and for those who, that, for, for those who have to remain virtual because of health concerns. So the benefits that we feel to this model, again, it allows groups of students to return to school. It allows us that opportunity to allow students that want to to return to school so that again, we're trying to do everything we can to get back to our why, which you see very clearly illustrated in this photo from uh, last year with our Link Crew group uh, serving students snacks as they study for final exams. 
We know that this model also allows us access to curriculum for all students, regardless of in-person or virtual learning choice. The simultaneous concurrent model allows us to also have fewer students on campus at any one time so that we can roll out and bring students back to school safely. It allows us to follow California Department of Health guidelines. It allows unique opportunities for in-person assistance for students that have chosen the in-person model. It also allows for virtual students who can't return for various reasons to continue to stay at home and access their curriculum. And it allows for our not, if you will, to stay together. It allows for our staff and our students to stay together to continue to build relationships that we know is so important in uh, our educational setting. We know that this model also, like any model, poses challenges. Some of those challenges are as we bring groups of students back together, we know that uh, there are concerns for COVID-19. We know that this is a new instructional model for staff. We know that balancing is diff that they will have to learn to balance students in person and their virtual students. We know that this uh, model poses supervision and staffing issues, which we'll touch more on throughout the presentation. There's also a funding, a cost of additional supervision. And we know that in students, in person students in this model will still be using their devices to access their classes. Now, well, again, what we have begun to do is to practice with using this model. We have learned that Zoom has the ability to host multiple cameras, to set up, in quotes, live stream. It's not really live stream, but it's live streaming like. And it allows options for our teacher to, teachers, again, to teach to both our students in person and our students that have to remain virtual. Here's a video highlighting some of our, some of our own Del Norte staff who have been piloting this model. You may have seen this at the last board meeting, and if not, here you go. Whoops. At Del Norte High School, students line up for health screenings before heading onto campus. They're attending class in person with their teachers who are participating in a pilot program with PUSD's Technology and Innovation Department, testing out what's called a simultaneous or concurrent teaching model. A concurrent teaching model is, it's a model of teaching where we are able to serve our students both virtually and on campus simultaneously uh, in the same classroom. Essentially, technology is set up in the classroom to allow teachers to reach all of their students at the same time. The solution that we created is giving teachers the flexibility uh, to deliver their instruction uh, simultaneously without creating separate work for each of those groups of students. We visited a few of these pilot classrooms to see what this might look like. In Scott Coates' AP government class, students were discussing the Federalist Papers. The in-person students were divided into small groups, and the virtual students were divided into breakout rooms on Zoom. What about their term makes it justified? Mr. Coates moved from the in-person groups to the virtual groups, dropping in on each to answer questions and spur discussion. Students in the breakout rooms were able to signal that they needed help. Students in person could raise their hand to get Mr. Coates' attention. A microphone and speaker in the classroom allowed both the in-person students and virtual to hear each other's questions and Mr. Coates' responses. Mr. Jim Krenz teaches math. He has one camera focused on the whiteboard and another on his desktop, and he can switch between the two to control what his online students see in Zoom. He says he thought the biggest barrier would be mastering the technology. I just grew into this and I had zero technology experience coming into this. And so what I what I just told myself is anything that you do different than the distance learning is going to be better, no matter what, and just constantly try to improve, right? So there's going to, if you try this or something similar to it, things are going to pop up that you're not going to be happy with, but you're going to know what those are. And if they're fixable, dude, you will fit, you'll figure it out. I mean, because if I can, anybody can, honestly. Did you already got any questions? Mr. Krenz feels his online students and in-person students both benefit from this way of teaching. 
So there, there is a lot going through my head about just thinking about the kids virtually, but if I think about them and get their instruction where it needs to be, the kids who are here in the house, in, in my classroom, it's just even more powerful for them. It was no more work for the kids to come into class. In Ms. Kimberly Pytel's chemistry class, she was preparing students for a lab on light spectra using a spectroscope. Ms. Pytel guided both her virtual and in-person students through the steps to take for the lab. We changed the lab so that it was fully virtual, obviously, for this year. But because I happened to have kids in the classroom today, and this happened to be the day that we planned as our chemistry department to do this lab, I figured I might as well give them that sort of in-person opportunity but also moved my computer, brought it to the actual gas tube and, and showed the kids at home what the kids in class were seeing so that it was a little bit more you know, personal in class. She explained that her experience with virtual learning helped prepare her for this pilot program. So for me, I knew all of the things that I was working with. It was just one extra piece for me to add on to like what I normally do is it's having you know two computers logged into a Zoom and being able to switch back and forth between those. And I don't know if I was really intimidated by any of it personally, um, but it, that's not to say that it wasn't a challenge. I mean, I would say give yourself grace. I think that um, you know our students are very understanding and know that those things are gonna go wrong, especially the first week that you practice. I think if it's better for any kids, for me, it's worth it. Teachers interested in piloting the concurrent teaching model can contact their principal. The technology and innovation department will work with secondary school sites to support the implementation of this model. So again, I wanted to uh, bring in some teacher voice to the discussion for a few minutes um, to so that they again have an opportunity to kind of share with us what the process of concurrent teaching looks like. And I um, wanted to share a quick video from one of our teachers who's with us tonight, Ms. Lauren DiCaprio, who is our ceramics teacher. Um, she put together a short little video that I want to share. Ms. DiCaprio here in the ceramic studio. I just wanted to take a moment really quickly to say hello and thank you. Thank you so much for your support, your kindness and your patience as we've navigated courses like ceramics. Thank you for allowing your kitchens and garages and children's bedrooms to be covered in dust so that they can make beautiful things. Truly, they have been amazing. I've been so impressed with the quality of work the dedication, attention to detail uh, that are coming from your home. So thank you. I also just wanted to communicate. Uh, we are getting students back and it's been amazing. It's been so great to hear students say, oh, Miss D, I miss the studio and, and be able to be on the potter's wheels and utilize machinery and tools that just don't exist in, in your homes. Uh, we are, of course, doing it safely and distanced. Uh, and we're allowed and able to uh, Zoom at the same time, which has been adventurous, but amazing and um, so grateful. I wanted to show you some of their beautiful work and just honor them and honor you and just let you know that we are so committed to serving all students to the best of our ability, even in these bizarre times. So thank you, thank you for your patience. And I really, truly just wanted to honor each of your students and say, well done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Caprio. We also wanted to um, have Mr. Krenz just speak for just a brief second about, uh, again, we heard from in the video, Mr. Krenz. All right, I, I'm gonna go ahead and share screen. So all this will be live. Uh, let me do that right now. Okay, so we're switching cameras. So this is where I have, so this is the computer where I have like a 10th degree sunburn, but the district has, has uh, really done a good job of supporting the technology in this particular camera. I can move around anywhere I want, which you'll see a little bit later. So um, what I'd like to do is just kind of give you an idea of what um, the different teaching modalities that you're, um, 
that your uh, uh, a child will, will be experiencing throughout the day. And again, this just covers a few of them. One of them could be uh, what, their, what uh, their teacher could be behind the desk right now, going ahead and talking to the students as I am. And um, of course they would have their mask on. So I'm gonna put my mask on um, as I would be and uh, doing their thing. And, and it'll be very similar to what they've already been experienced, experiencing. And uh, so in my classroom, um, my kids are doing a combination of watching me teach live, like the live streaming, um, as well as some uh, breakout room group work stuff in, uh, in using the, uh, the breakout room feature in the Zoom session. So, so what I, in my class, what we might just do is go ahead and switch cameras. And then I would walk over here and teach a simple, this is a simple math problem. I don't know if you guys remember it from a long time ago, where you're going to factor this into x minus 2, x plus 2 and uh, divide out to one, leaving this answer. Um, so this is one modality you might see in terms of the, the uh, direct instruction, which uh, depending on the technology, this could be switched to. Um, some students might be seeing their, hearing their teacher. And again, these are all being done right now. I'm just demonstrating what I've seen a number of teachers do at our site. Um, in this case, where they're hearing my voice, but they can't see me, but they're watching the, um, the uh, uh, doc cam, okay? Um, two, uh, taking this camera. So again, um, some of the tech, again, the, the technology that is being used can be, um, uh, let me switch cameras. Again, you're watching this live, so uh, things aren't always perfect. Let me go ahead and switch cameras. And here I am. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you what the classroom is gonna look like. Um, it, when your child does, if your child does come to class. So you're gonna see, uh, this would be like an example. I went ahead and did the baseball theme with the, uh, got Mr. Lafferty, Sheldon, Einstein, and actually my son there, who's a senior. Um, they're gonna be behind the plexiglass uh, dividers along with a, um, if they're gonna be zooming in that class, There'll be Chromebooks provided if needed. If they bring in their own laptop, they can. And um, uh, if it's direct instruction, they wouldn't have the laptop there or a combination of both. They would be taking the laptop out and watching the direct instruction. You see the uh, air purifier there in the center. And um, so again, this is just a setup of four um, uh, uh, students. But um, again, that gives you an idea of what your child will be experiencing when they attend if they attend campus. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Krenz. Yep. I uh, will stop. Okay, there we go. Thank you. And uh, lastly, we have Mr. Coates, who again, he's just saw briefly in the video. Mr. Coates, anything to add? Uh, yeah, I'll keep it short. I think um, what was important to me uh, was making sure that students that were virtual and students that were in class had an equitable uh, experience and that no one uh, got too much attention one way or the other, that, that all students were um, participating together, getting the full instruction. And I found that through the model um, and through a, a, a brief learning curve of technology, I was able to uh, stand before the class of students live and before um, my virtual students and have discussions, have chats, uh, do breakout rooms, as Mr. Kren said, um, and uh, allow students who were in class also to participate in breakout runs in class, an opportunity to socialize uh, with fellow students live and in person that they hadn't really seen. Um, and I, you know, the feedback was really positive from the students that I had in my pilot. Uh, they were excited to be back on campus, excited to be seniors, excited to, to, to be Nighthawks um, in, uh, in the real situation. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. DiCaprio, Mr. Kranz and Mr. Coates, uh, Ms. Pytel as well it was in the video. We appreciate that. Uh, so again, in the simultaneous or, or concurrent teaching model, uh, very important to note that teachers, again, would be teaching both their virtual students and their in-person students within the same class period concurrently. Now, I want to talk about what does this look like in the life of a student from both the virtual setting and both the in-person setting? Um, so again, if you're a virtual student under this model, uh, your life really doesn't change much from it is now. They're going to continue to log in virtually to their, to their teacher's Canvas page and participate just as they have been in school. Uh, their teachers may be virtual or they may be on campus, but the 
positive of this model is that the methodology in which they receive instruction doesn't change and it again allows for both that virtual student or in-person student to access their curriculum as you've seen from uh, the model from Mr. Krenz, Ms. Decap, and uh, Mr. Coates and Ms. Pytel. The in-person student, again under this model, will again have the opportunity to attend school um, ultimately two days a week. And we'll talk more about what that means as we uh, work through the presentation. Students will be divided into alpha split cohort models. And again, we'll talk more about this specifically uh, in, in some of our next slides. With the days that in-person students are not on campus, just as they are now, they'll attend class virtually throughout the rest of this trimester and, and uh, continuing forward. Again, the days that students are on campus, they're gonna follow the same class schedule that they've been on. They're gonna attend classes during the same time periods that they have been on. So again, this, uh, this opportunity, this, this plan that we have, our schedule does not change. It's going to remain the same so that we have a equitable piece to both our virtual students and our in-person students. For class periods where a teacher is teaching virtually, we will have a supervisor or substitute in classrooms where students will go to work on their classes virtually just as they have been now. So again, we're looking at having supervisor substitutes um, on campus during this time to accommodate the need for supervision for those periods that students that are in person may have a virtual class or classes throughout the day. So looking at how we're rolling this out is what uh, we're calling a phased reopening approach. And currently we are in phase one. From now until the end of trimester one, we're allowing teachers if they choose to come back onto campus to get familiar with teaching back in their classroom, to get familiar with technology, to invite small cohorts of students to their classroom. And this can occur anytime between now and again, the end of the trimester. The maximum number of students that we have returning for a single class period, and this will remain constant when we do return during tri-semester two, is 18 will be the maximum number of students that we have in a class. That will allow us to follow CDPH guidelines of keeping students at six feet distance and allowing the teacher to have six feet of space between students as well. So we're doing this in a safe way. Um, we want to be able to reopen and stay open. We do not want to have to reopen and then have to shut down. So we're looking first and foremost of keeping our students and our staff safe as we reopen. And we're looking to also continue to follow the California Department of Health guidelines. Our phase two of our reopening plan begins trimester two, where all of our teachers that are able to uh, we'll return to campus November 30th, which is the beginning of trimester two, when we come off of our Thanksgiving um, holiday or break. Again, students will be alpha split into cohorts. Currently, we have students based on the July survey in A through L groups and M through Z. They'll return to campus during this three-week time period after uh, Thanksgiving break at the beginning of trimester two through the beginning of winter break, they'll come back to campus one day a week during this part of the reopening phase. So our A through L cohort would come to school on Tuesday, our M through Z cohort, cohort would come to school on Thursday, and students would be virtual Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Again, our teachers will be delivering instruction virtually for three days and simultaneously concurrently for two days during this time period. Now, by Phasing in our approach, we allow an opportunity for teachers to become comfortable with the protocols that we have in place, to understand the technology that we have in place. It allows our students an opportunity to learn the protocols, how to come onto campus, how to exit campus, how to navigate around campus, how to wear their masks all day, how to continually stay socially distanced, both inside and out of classes. And it allows us administration and our campus supervisors to get a firsthand look of students entry and exit from campus. And also it allows us to adjust and change our lunch supervisions so that we have students manage, so that we have them safely distance. And so that again, we continue to, 
the process of reopening. And then phase three of this approach would begin after we return from winter break on January 4th, 2021, where student return to campus is then expanded. Our alpha cohort will be on campus two days a week and day five of the week will be a virtual day for all students. And we have a sample schedule for you later in the presentation on slide 14 of 356 slides. That's my joke for the night, folks. That's as good as it gets. Uh, again, teachers will deliver instructional content in both the simultaneous and concurrent model as encouraged by our school board. So we're now on uh, slide 14. And again, here's a sample schedule of what our day and week would look like for both our on-campus and VLA students. And the sample that you see here would be in our from our phase three, that return from winter break on January 4th. We're on campus for Monday, we would have cohort one, that's that A through L cohort. On Tuesday would be our M through Z and so on and so forth. Friday, uh, nobody's on campus, it's a virtual day for all. And then we see in the virtual setting, we have both on Mondays, our cohort two and our virtual learning students. And on, um, Mr. on Schultz. Tuesday, we have cohort one, and we have virtual learning students as well. And again, our bell schedule will not change during our reopening phase. It will stay the way that it is now with an eight o'clock start time and a 2.10 start time with tutorials on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday after school from 2.20 till three o'clock. So looking again at life on campus, we have protocols that we have set in place to allow for safe entry and exit. And as students can arrive no earlier than 7.30 a.m., again, students will be on their current schedule to accommodate both in-person and virtual students. Students that are in person as they arrive, they will have their temperature checked as they currently do. Um, for students that are coming back to school, we will be sending out a health and safety agreement. Some of our students have already received this that have returned to campus and our health and safety uh, form will state things such as parents understand that and students understand that they won't send students to school if they have symptoms, if they've been in contact with somebody that has tested positive for COVID, if um, they have symptoms themselves, and so this will be in place uh, when we return to campus. Again, under the alpha cohort model, we will have approximately eight to 900 students on campus daily. Again, we have already established an 18 to one setup in our classrooms and that number of 18 to one being the largest number that we would have in class at any one time. Again, each student will have their temperature taken to follow protocol. We will only have three entrances available to students to gain access to campus, one by our um, one by our ticket booth, by our stadium entrance, and then the two entrances on either side of our library. Again, we will stress and that students will be asked to socially distance during passing periods of lunch. We will not have a nutrition break during the schedule. All students will be required to wear masks at all times while on campus. And lunch and fourth period may be adjusted to create a safer environment on campus. And also note that we will be resurveying our families be prior to the start of our reopening. Now, with this model, we also know that there are additional costs that we have to keep in mind to the simultaneous model. To cover our classes of VLA teachers and in-person students, we currently uh, need 27 additional staff, parent volunteers, supervisors to cover classes that have in-person students where their teacher is virtual. So if you are interested in becoming a level two volunteer, we are, we'll, we'll be more than happy to assist you in allowing us to bring you onto site to help with temperature checks, to potentially help with supervision during passing periods and at lunch. We also know that there are additional costs uh, with expenses for webcams, for additional teacher computers, or cables that might be needed uh, for PPE expenses. 
and other costs that we have to keep in mind as we continue to progress towards our reopening phase. Next steps that we have coming up. Our, our board has asked for our detailed plans, which we're presenting to you tonight to be delivered to them at the November 12th board meeting. So they will be discussing at the November 12th board meeting our secondary plans. We have issues and steps to solve the financial and technological pieces of supporting this plan. We wanna make sure that we have appropriate PPE uh, to support this plan. Uh, just yesterday, we received our tabletop dividers. Uh, many of our disinfectants were delivered yesterday, as well as additional masks that might be needed to use throughout our reopening as well. Throughout the course of the next several weeks, we will also be pushing out PSAs, our public service announcements created for students and parents on the importance of social distancing, on mask wearing protocols, on campus entry and exit procedures. So now we are at the point in which we get the opportunity to respond to some of the questions that again were put to us prior to the presentation in our Google form that we didn't feel were answered during the actual presentation. And I know that uh, our assistant principals continue to respond in live time to questions so some of the questions that um, we received on the Google form that weren't necessarily answered in the context of the presentation. Um, one of the questions that was sent to us uh, in multiple formats in multiple different ways were, when will students know which classes may be virtual or in person? And that's a great question uh, that really all of the secondary schools are getting. And so the answer to that question is, as we get closer to trimester two, We'll be, we will be communicating out schedules to our students and our families, and our schedules will have listed on them which classes will be in person and which classes will be virtual. And at this point uh, in the process, um, we have many of our um, personnel that are going through the process of identifying uh, whether or not they will be virtual or in person. Another question that was sent in in multiple varieties that wasn't necessarily addressed in the course of the presentation was that around PPE. Again, currently classrooms are being uh, assembled. You saw an example of that uh, that Mr. Crenn showed us with um, his webcam. So we, our classrooms again are being assembled for again that 18 to one ratio, which will be the most amount of students that we can put into a classroom that meets guidelines that keeps, again, students distance at actually more than six feet. We have desk dividers that I mentioned were just delivered yesterday. We have HEPA filters, which you saw that in Mr. Krenz's room in every single classroom. Each of our HEPA filters um, cleans 1,500 square feet of space, which is much larger than any one of our classrooms. We also have hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes um, that have been delivered and are being deployed to our classrooms as well. Another question that was submitted in our Google document from uh, the previous week was the idea of, can I choose to be in person if I've changed my mind from the July survey? And again, as I just mentioned, we will be resurveying our uh, students and families to identify what their current um, choice will be. Another question that was sent in, um, as we know, um, we was about centering around what happens if we move to the purple tier? And another great question. So if San Diego County moves to the purple tier, this will not impact or change our current reopening plan because we have already been open prior to moving to purple. And schools that had been open or were reopening prior to moving into the purple tier, are allowed to continue with their reopening plan. So those are some of the questions that we were sent that were sent into us that we feel were not answered in the context of the presentation. And so we have a little bit of time to answer some questions uh, in the, that we're seeing in the chat that are coming around certain topics. Ms. Sanchez, do you have any specific questions? 
that I can share with our constituents tonight? Sure. Uh, one of the questions is, are students responsible for wiping down their desks after each class for the next class? So students are going to obviously be encouraged to help with the process. So yes, we're going to um, encourage students to help us with that process in between class. Each night's uh, classrooms will be deep cleaned by our custodial staff uh, with hydrostatic or sorry, electrostatic uh, cleaning tools throughout the school day. Custodial staff will be moving around campus, cleaning and sanitizing high touch points throughout the course of the day. What else do we have, Ms. Sanchez? Next question, will a survey be sent out to everyone so we know which teacher is going virtual versus in-person? So again, those personnel issues and personnel, uh, personnel pieces are being worked through currently. And again, as I mentioned in uh, the question that was submitted to us on the Google form, as we get closer to the start of trimester two, we'll be communicating with families and students of which of their classes will be virtual and which will be in person. Another question, are there any updates on athletics starting in December? Will yes, spectators thank you. I actually meant to address athletics before we started. It was a big topic. We had many questions sent in on athletics. I apologize for not starting there uh, because I wanted to address that at the beginning. So yes, currently athletics has a start date for our fall sports on December 12th. We continue to receive and will continue to receive guidance from CIF, from our conference and from our school board. So as we get closer to December 12th, we'll have more specific information on uh, athletics. Another one, what happens if a student or teacher tests positive or suspects they have COVID? So one of the, so let me start with the student piece. So again, one of the pieces that's going to be in the health question or the health document that we're going to be sending out to eventually everybody is that one of the asks that we have as a school is again to make sure that if a student wakes up in the morning and has symptoms that they stay home and get tested um, or potentially get tested. Same thing goes with a, a staff member. If a staff member wakes up in the morning and does not feel well, um, is showing symptoms or signs that we are asking them to stay home, and one of the beauties of the concurrent simultaneous model is it allows for us to continue our learning in the same fashion uh, that we're currently in, in virtual learning, um, whether or not a student or staff member is not feeling well. Now, one question that might come up is, I'm sure it has come up in the chat, is what if a student in one of my child's classes tests positive for COVID? And that is another great question that I'll just address. It may not necessarily be in this question, uh, but if based on the fact that we are following guidelines and we are having students distance in class at that six foot, if a student in a class uh, comes down, and God forbid, with COVID, only that student has to uh, quarantine. A message will go out to the entire class and then the family of that individual will have the opportunity to decide the best next steps for that family. Now, as a district, uh, we have been monitoring uh, COVID in the schools that are currently open. And one of the pieces that we are finding through the data and through the tracing is that uh, the students that have come down with COVID are, uh, have not come down with it in the school setting, but it's uh, happened outside of the school setting. Another question. Yes. If more than 18 students opt to come back on campus for a particular class, how do you decide who gets to come on campus? So again, what we're doing in the master scheduling piece and what we've currently done is to ensure that no class is over that 18 to one. In fact, most of our classes are lower than that. And that is again, why we will need to know that data on what your current choice is so that we can continue to make those adjustments to again, ensure that we are doing our reopening safely and that we have met protocols of allowing, having students six feet apart in classes. Another question, what does no nutrition break mean? 
So if you look at our current, let me back up. Let's go back to pre-COVID and our schedule. Um, we had a nutrition break or a break after second period. It was a 10 minute break. Um, so some parents have asked, will there be a nutrition break if when we go back to reopening our schools? So no, we will not have a 10 minute nutrition break. Uh, our schedule will stay exactly as it is now, uh, where classes will still be 60 minutes in length. There'll still be 10 minute transition time uh, between classes. So that's what that meant. Hopefully that answers that question. Another question. Will students with IEPs be brought on campus with more frequency to take tests? group tutorial, learning strategies, classes, et cetera, as stated in their IEPs? So that's a great question. It's a question that, again, continues to, to pop up and come up. And currently, uh, our plan will be to have students in their cohorts come on twice a week so that we can safely uh, bring students on campus and still be able to follow California Department of Health guidelines. Next question, would students be able to leave to go home for lunch during their on-campus day? Currently, yes. So what's important to note for uh, families is that students during this model and during this, this model that we currently have, uh, there needs to be discussions at home because yes, students will have the opportunity uh, to be able to uh, leave campus for lunch if they are so wanting to. And there'll be more information on that process as we get closer to reopening as well. Another question, is the school district providing COVID-19 testing as needed? Uh, for our students, no, we will be setting up a COVID testing center for our staff in Rancho Bernardo. It won't be on a school site. Another question, is there enough PPE available to ensure students that come on campus with an ill-fitting mask or unsafe mask can be afforded another? Yes, we do have, uh, like I mentioned, we do have masks on site for students that you know, might have forgotten their mask or need a mask for the day. So we do have a limited number of masks that we will be able to distribute to students throughout the course of our reopening phase. Okay, and another question, will there be any contact tracing from lunch groups? What if a friend from a lunch comes down with COVID? How will students be distanced during lunch? So that's a great question. And that's a question again, that, that has been asked multiple times. Um, and it, it's a, it's a multi-pronged answer. It really also, it, it starts with us through our PSAs, really stressing the importance of maintaining social distance for students when they are on campus. It is also something that we are asking our parents, our families, our guardians to stress as well to their students for those that are coming back on campus, that there is an absolute need to maintain distance from a site. We are limiting uh, the number of seats in our covered lunch area so that students will have you know, seats that we've marked off at six feet. We as a staff, our campus supervisors, our administration, our supervisors that will be helping out during the school day, we will constantly be walking the grounds at lunch during breaks to make sure to the best possible that way that we can that students are distance. And it really is a community effort in this response. We really want to, again, limit the number of students that we do have on campus at any one time so that we can do this safely, so that we can continue to stay, re, continue to stay open and to continue to safely and effectively educate our students by giving them the opportunity to come back on campus in person. We do want them to have opportunities to socialize Socialization looks much different in the COVID world than it does in uh, the pre-COVID world, obviously. We know this to be a fact. So we are going to work together as a team to constantly continue to stress the importance to our students that are coming back that they have to wear their masks, that they have to remain distance. And that's going to be uh, one of our biggest challenges but we all have to work together to continually be sharing that same message of the need to stay distanced, to wear your masks, 
it's going to allow us to continue to stay open. Another question, do you expect PE classes to start on campus? Yes, PE classes will start on campus and our ENS and PE department is working tirelessly to identify the safest and best way to allow students to have um, physical activity. Um, but yes, we do plan to have PE classes and ENS classes when we reopen. Next question, if my student happens to have periods one and two virtual and the rest of the periods in person, can my students stay home for periods one and two and then come to campus the rest of the day? Absolutely, and again, that's uh, what I'm saying are one of the benefits of this model. You know, part of our mission statement is to help create students that are college and career ready. And this opportunity allows for us and allows for Del Norte, allows for our students, allows for our community to have even more of a collegiate experience when they're in high school. So yes, if your child, as an example, has periods one and two uh, by a teacher that is virtual, um, they can come to school for their periods three, four, or three, four, five, or whatever the, the case may be. Again, they will be temperature checked um, and they will have their masks and they will follow the same protocols when they're here on campus as if they were here all day. And at the same time, if a student has a virtual class first and second period, and they have to be here first and second period, that's why we need that extra supervision and we'll have spaces and classrooms for students that have to take a virtual class first before they go to their in-person class or vice versa. Another question, can students with an IEP or 504 have the option to attend schools four days a week if this accommodation is needed? So again, currently our model is to have students on campus, again, for guideline uh, and safety regulations on campus two days a week. If virtual is selected, will the student schedule or teachers be shifted as well, or will they keep the same teachers? Now, again, the beauty of this model is if a student is virtual, uh, they will be with their same teacher just as they are now. How will families be notified when someone is suspected to be COVID positive? So again, uh, as an example, if a student tests positive and we're notified, uh, then we will send a district letter to all students in that classroom or classes. And, that, and then families will have the option to identify what their next best steps are and either getting tested or quarantining if they choose. And again, the beauty of this model is, is it allows for students, even staff that might have to quarantine to be able to continue with their learning because they would just revert to the virtual model. Another question, are there discussions regarding moving period four before lunch so students with period five off roll can just leave at lunch similar to prior years? Yes, that is something that our leadership team is uh, looking into and identifying. And I will say just from looking at that schedule, um, one of the, and I'll just say it, I'll throw out, I'll be transparent, be as transparent as I possibly can. One of uh, the, the challenges with moving lunch uh, after fourth period, um, while it limits the number of students that are on campus, it also increases just the straight amount of screen time potentially. So that's, but yes, we are weighing that option as well. Another question, will families be able to revisit their choice between try two and try three? Yes, as we um, mentioned you know, early on in the process, we will have those opportunities for families to reevaluate. Has the school Wi-Fi been updated? Yes, so we, that question was asked by me uh, several weeks ago and we have, we've had uh, IT out here multiple times. And one of the benefits of being the newest school in the district is that um, when Del Norte was built, we had a more robust um, Wi-Fi system put in, so we don't have the same challenges as some of our um, older schools in Poway Unified. So yes, IT has told me that we have the capacity and capability to accommodate uh, 
the number of students that we're looking to potentially bring back so that we won't have Wi-Fi issues. Now, with the caveat, we're going to have Wi-Fi issues. It just happens in the happens naturally in the virtual world. Uh, but we do have that capabilities. And again, I've been assured by IT that that's not an issue here. If your class is in person, can they virtually go to school that day without being counted as absent? Yes, again, one of the beauties of um, this system and this uh, model is that allows for students to make that choice. Again, that's a, you know, so if you're an in-person student, you know, it's going to be very important to communicate with your family that, you know, you're going to stay home that day and do class just as you are currently. But yes, that is an option. And no, you won't be marked absent. That was actually the question. Next one, does OC versus VLA selection blanket all classes or can a student choose particular classes that they need on campus and which ones they are fine with VLA? Can you read the question again? Does on-campus versus VLA selection blanket all classes or can a student choose particular classes that they need on campus for and which ones they are fine with VLA? So um, what I'm thinking the question is asking, and I apologize if I'm not answering it correctly. So we will make your child's schedule based on their requests and their class, their teachers will be determined based on what their course request forms from following spring were determined as. So your child may receive both a mix of in-person and virtual teachers. I hope that answered the question. If not, please shoot me an email. Mr. Schultz, I'm gonna jump in just really quick. I wanna yep. make something really clear with our families. Um, we're gonna be sending out Del Norte High School within the next week or two um, after we do our presentations, a new survey to parents. So they have a choice based on what we've presented to uh, have the opportunity to choose uh, a different path or continue the same path. So I just want to make sure that we're absolutely clear that we will be resurveying parents. Thank you, Mr. Giami. Yes. Sorry, I didn't make that clear. Another question, Mr. Schultz. If a student presents symptoms at school, is there a system in place to ensure that students are returning to school safely? For example, a doctor's clearance, test results, et cetera. Yes, correct. So if a student um, tests positive, um, then yes, they will need to share with us that as they return that they are no longer Will the list of teachers going in person or on campus be available before the new survey comes out? So those personnel issues are still being determined at this point. Mr. Schultz, I also want to talk about our, our the local testing sites that are open right now. Um, Pablo Unified School District will not have any school sites testing in Correct. regards to Ranch Bernardo. Correct. Correct. So That's the I county mentioned. Mentioned now has there. working offices open in uh, San Marcos, Escondido, and the Del Mar Fairgrounds right now currently. And Powell Unified School District is working with elected officials to open up uh, another location within Rancho Bernardo so it's a little bit closer for our needs. Correct. And that's what I mentioned previously, um, that the district is looking to open a testing site in RB, not at a school site is what I mentioned. Next one, in phase two, are all teachers back on campus or is it their choice? So yeah, so, so starting trimester two, November 30th, we're looking to have our teachers back on campus. Another question, if a student Sorry, is scheduled let me, let me, to be- Let me rephrase that, Ms. for a second, those that are able to. Okay, next question. If a student is scheduled to be virtual but wants to come on campus, can they? And if so, wouldn't that be potential for more than 18 to one per the room? Yes, yeah, so that's why we're going to be resurveying our families to make that choice so that we can then create uh, the safe spaces that we need. So if a student decides, family decides virtual, um, then they will be virtual. If they want to switch that option, um, there may be a possibility. It's going to depend on the amount of seats that we have available for in-person. 
another, and I actually only have two questions left and we have two minutes left. In phase one, can you please remind me which days students may come in if their teachers are on campus? So in phase one, which we're currently in, the teachers that are on campus and are bringing small cohorts in will actually reach out to their classes. And the very last question I have on here is, at what point does a classroom quarantine? How many positive cases? So if we're looking at a whole class, um, I actually have to look into those exact numbers. I don't know them off the top of my head. So that is a question that we will investigate and uh, get back to you. That's a great question. And again, that's the, that's the one that stumped me tonight. Now, again, I want to um, assure you that we, again, I'm going to have three more of these town hall meetings. The next one is going to be next Wednesday. Initially, I had said it's going to be on Tuesday. I apologize, that is election night, I missed that. So that will be moved to next Wednesday. It'll be at the same time from 6.30 to 7.30. The following one after that will be the next Tuesday after that, again, from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. And the final one, the following Tuesday after that, will be a morning session from 8.30 to 9.30. And I will be pushing out the specific information for the next town hall meetings later this week in my Nighthawk News, which I try and get out every Friday evening. We wanna thank you for joining us tonight. There was a lot of information given. Again, please note that we over the next three weeks will work incredibly hard to answer every single question out there. I wanna be transparent with our community. I wanna give everybody an opportunity to have their voice heard. I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. It was great to see all of you virtually. Um, and again, I know there's a lot of information to process. Please take some time. Again, we'll be producing a frequently asked question, sending that to our website as well as this presentation. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your evening. Remember, go Nighthawks. We are one school, one flock, Nighthawks strong. Thank you. Have a great evening, everybody.